The doctor will see you now, but in a different way. Telemedicine uses technology to diagnose and treat illness remotely. For the aging, it can provide 24-hour care without a hospital stay and improve quality of life through more accessible treatment options. Joining us to discuss the latest innovations in telemedicine are the Interim Vice Chancellor of UC Davis Health, Dr. Tom Nesbitt, and Heather Young, the Dean of UC Davis School of Nursing, next on Studio Sacramento. At Five Star Bank, we create thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive, from economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. This Studio Sacramento episode is supported by UC Davis Health, where doctors, nurses, researchers, and staff share a passion for advancing health. Learn more about their latest medical innovations at health.ucdavis.edu. Dr. Nesbitt, what is changing in society that is leading to this drive for innovation in delivering care remotely? Well, I think there's a number of things. We're sort of in a, a perfect storm right now where we have um, an aging population. Um, we have a population that um, is using more health care. And as people are getting older and staying alive older and wanting to be active older, they happen to live with more chronic diseases. So we have a number of people that have chronic diseases, and luckily they are living longer, but the, the fact that they have these chronic diseases um, requires them to be more engaged with the healthcare system. And we also, at the same time, are experiencing, particularly in some areas of the country and in this state, uh, caregiver shortages. So we have to think about new and innovative ways of caring for people um, with chronic disease and acute diseases. And so that's driving us to look at new models of care. And technology has a lot to offer in that area. So new technology-enabled models of care are really um, becoming um, quite popular and being used more frequently. But Dr. Young, we all prize the personal attention and the touch of, for instance, nurses. And so we've liked being in, in facilities to a certain extent because we know that a call button away is a nurse. How does telemedicine replace that? Well, I wouldn't think of it as replacing anything, Scott. It's really about using enabling technology in conjunction with the human side of things. And in fact, most people want to age in their own homes and they'd prefer not to ever go to a clinical setting if they possibly can. And with a workforce that's moving more and more into homes, with the ability to bring nurses into homes and other healthcare providers as well, coupled with technology, I think we can in some ways craft a different way of delivering care. And, and in crafting that different way, how is that transforming the, the profession of nursing? Well, nurses are, are developing new ways of thinking about their practice. It used to be that about 80% of our graduates went into hospitals to practice. And now, just in the short period of less than 10 years, it's down to 60%. So we're really moving more and more into community settings. There's more opportunities for nurses to think about how to provide person-centered care in the, at the time when people really want it and need it, because health happens everywhere. And it's about having the right person at the right time in the right place. And usually it's where the consumer wants to be the most. I really like that term, person-centered care. Yeah. These innovations that are happening how is it that medicine is being transformed where we're, we're really looking at the individual and how to improve their outcomes as, as opposed to more of sort of an assembly line approach? Yes, I think that's true. And I think that these models of care really um, can um, encourage that kind of thinking. Um, in the past, what we've done is we've, we've moved the patient to the expertise. Now we're thinking about ways of moving the expertise to where the patient is. Um, so that's more, that's more patient or person focused. Um, we 
you know, have tended to um, look at the way we deliver health care. It, it's really been provider sort of centric. Um, and we've also really um, focused all of our care on the professional caregiver with, much, with not a lot of communication. What do you mean by that? Well, we've, we've tended to, all the care has been delivered by professional caregivers. And we know that there's a huge amount of care that's actually delivered by family members and informal caregivers. And so we have to figure out ways to bring them into the process. And technology can help us safely bring them into the process of you know, having them be the, the, the hands at home when we're engaging a patient at home, when we're monitoring somebody at home, when we're engaging with a, somebody at home through video conferencing, we can have somebody who's, who's there with the, with the patient and, and them be the hands of the caregiver, uh, the professional caregiver. And, and having engaging those non-professional caregivers mm -hmm. as part of the quote unquote treatment team uh, actually enhances the health outcomes for the individual in question as opposed to just moving them inside to a hospital? Well, it, it does because we're able to provide care on a round the clock kind of basis. Um, and I think that because um, in the past there's not been good communication between those caregivers and the professional care team, a lot of things have gotten missed. Um, and we've, we've tended to um, assume that what we hear and see and measure in an office setting, in a very artificial setting, is what the reality is for that patient when they're outside of that setting. When in reality, when you're in the doctor's office, your blood pressure may be higher, your heart rate may be higher, you, you know, all those things may be quite a bit different than when you're in your home in your normal setting. And if we can engage patients in that setting, measure those kinds of um, parameters in their home, we can treat them on a round-the-clock basis. And then family caregivers can also give us more information um, on a round-the-clock basis about what's really going on. That medication's making, making my mother tired, or she doesn't seem to be finding her words as well when she's on that medication, particularly at night. We may not get that information if we didn't, weren't able to engage the, the patient and their, and their uh, family caregivers in their home. Dr. Nesbitt raises a really interesting point about engagement. Yes. I can speak from personal experience in terms of taking care of a loved one of my own that there doesn't seem, I feel totally at a loss sometimes, mm -hmm. and there doesn't seem to be a, a lot of support and training out there. What's UC Davis doing in order to provide more tools for those of us who are actively involved in a loved one's care? Well, you're bringing up an issue, Scott, that, that so many families are facing in the country now, and it's an invisible problem to a large extent. We're really excited that at UC Davis, we've recently founded the Family Caregiving Institute, and the focus of that institute is twofold. One is to support family caregivers with the knowledge and supports that they need to be able to do what they're being asked to do in some cases, volunteering to do, and facing challenges day to day. And the second part of it is to work to develop a better understanding on the part of healthcare providers, nurses and doctors and others about what do family caregivers really need? How can we do a better job of including you? How can we provide you with the information you need in the time that you need it? We've been partnering with AARP, which is one of the largest consumer organizations in the country, to develop videos, for example. And some of these videos are resources that help with instruction for family caregivers around things like wound care. You know, how do I persuade my mom to take a medication when she doesn't want to take one? Please tell me. Those kinds of issues. <laughs> because they're very important questions and they're, they're very practical. They're the kinds of things that people face every day and we're hoping to increase the availability of that type of information. You know, you open a really interesting door because one of the things that I think all of us deal with when we're dealing with a loved one mm -hmm. is you never quite know, does something rise to the level of, well, do I need to take her in? Yes. Or is this something that can be handled a different way? Mm -hmm. Do I disturb the physician or the nurse on call at that time? And technology being a bridge, 
it sounds like it could be such a stress reliever, not mm -hmm. only to the patient, but for those that are around them. Absolutely, and it's, it's about having the conversation together where the family caregiver is with the person who's getting the care, with the health care providers, and talking about what should I worry about? When should I call you? And how can I get in touch with you easily? That may not be an office appointment, but maybe there's a way to text or a way to get conversations going or send data. I mean, it's wonderful for nurses and physicians to get information that's real-time data about how things are going. And the technology enables us to do some of that. What are some of the most exciting innovations in technology that are now being moved out into the, the community that you think are going to have an impact on improving lifestyle and quality of health? Yeah. Well, I think there's, uh, they fit into several categories. So there are um, technologies that monitor things like heart rate, blood pressure, something we call pulse oximetry, how well your blood's being oxygenated. Um, we can obviously measure glucose, um, people's weight and people's activity. So we can, all that information can be passively sent to a care team if people are, you know, using those monitors, wearing those kinds of monitors. There is now, because of the how computers are now and how, you know, with Skyping and things like that, but also with um, even your television set, um, there's gonna, it's gonna be easier and easier to uh, do two-way interactive video conferencing from the home in, with really high quality. So being able to video conference with your care team, with a nutritionist, with a, your nurse, with your, your physician will be easier to do from your home. There's also um, some other um, technology out there around, you mentioned med medication and how do you get someone to take a medication. There are medication adherence systems that range all the way from... What does that mean, medication adherence? <laughs> well, so making sure that somebody right. takes their medication. Mm -hmm. so Reminding, for yeah, example. Rem there are reminders where you, it, you, know, you have the, pe the pills laid out by the week, by the day of the week, and when you open that up and empty that, or you open the bottle, there's a, a message sent that says you did take your, your really? medication. Yes, so they have those. They also, there's some new technology out there um, that actually is a chip that goes inside the pill. And there's a, uh, something you wear that when the, when the pill gets into your stomach, it, that little digestible harmless chip dissolves and fires off a signal that says that you actually, that you actually swallowed the pill. But there's, there's several kinds of systems that are out there that, that tell you whether, you, whether someone's taken the, their medication. Then there are um, technologies around rehabilitation. So um, the gaming systems that are out there um, are, are very good at measuring motion accurately. That's how they know if you hit the tennis ball right or you know, hit the baseball right in the video game you're playing. That can also be uh, repurposed and we've done that with a team to repurpose that so it accurately measures your rehabilitation motion. So if you're trying to rehabilitate your shoulder, it knows that you're, mo you're doing the movement exactly right and then we can connect with your physical therapy team to measure that. Do, do, do patients find that approach more fun than traditional therapy? Well, so far we've tested on a number of people and they do. And the, the other thing about it is that, again, they don't have to go to a physical therapist and watch them or even worse, when you prescribe home physical therapy and you, they, the, the, the doctor says, well, have you been doing your physical therapy? And you say, I think so, I think I've been doing it right. They can say, yeah, it looks like you've been doing it perfectly. Um, and so they can make decisions in that way. There is one um, piece of this that's, that's critical though. And the critical piece of this is to get the information from those monitors, from the rehabilitation, to integrate that into the electronic health record. And that is a bigger challenge than a lot of people realize. Why? Well, because the information that's coming from devices has to be um, configured in a way that can go through a, a, a gateway and into the electronic health record, but not just as raw data. So that the data that comes off a, a heart rate monitor or a blood pressure monitor needs to, be, needs to be converted into actionable information for a care team and then 
arrive in the patient's record. So when the care team is seeing the patient, they can quickly look at a graph or something and see what's going on. That's a challenge that, that we've taken on actually through one of Heather's grants mm -hmm. um, and, and have some experience with that and really we're one of the first places in the country to integrate that kind of information. To, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about wearables. Now, this watch right here is one that, you know, monitors my heart rate mm -hmm. and, you know, how many steps I take and all that sort of, all that sort of thing. Will there be a, a, a greater movement to integrate and merge healthcare related technology and more consumer related technology in the future? Very much so. And you know, for so long, the development's been happening in two different parts and bringing it together and using it as meaningful data and interpreting it in a meaningful way is where we really need to head. So for someone who's got a chronic condition like diabetes, which takes a lot of adjustment in your lifestyle, your activity level, your food, your sleep, those kinds of issues, being able to bring real-time data in so that your healthcare provider can see it and see how it's affecting your blood sugar and whether you're getting better or not. Having that all come together is so helpful, both for the person who's got diabetes as well as for the healthcare provider who gets real live data about what's happening. So I can see it really making a big difference in being able for each of us to set our own goals for our health and monitor our own progress and do it in partnership with the healthcare system. What's most exciting to the nurses going through your program today about this explosion in technology? Well, the fact that it's, it's becoming ubiquitous. You know, most people are walking around with at least a cell phone and oftentimes wearables as well. And the idea of being able to actually harness that and use that to improve health is very exciting. And because it takes it out of something that's owned by the people in white coats in a clinical setting, and it means that each of us in our own way can own our own health and use the information we gather to set our own goals, to work with uh, the conditions that we're grappling with, and to improve health. I think there's a tremendous opportunity there. And for older adults, the thought of being able to stay in our own homes, to be able to get the care we need and to coordinate it, and to get the right supports at the right time is, is a big motivator. Mm -hmm. Well, in a recent uh, documentary um, called Forever Young, uh, one of the things that, that was talked about was how aging itself is changing. And like many things, the baby boomers uh, have you know, said, we're going to do it differently than in the past. Yeah. How is graceful aging or healthy aging changing? Well, I think healthy aging is, is changing. One of the reasons it's changing is because the period of time between when someone retires and dies is thankfully you know increasing and so there's a big chunk of people's lives that they are they're not going to work every day they're they're they have to find other things to do with their time and because they're living longer they are you know uh, living with one or more chronic diseases a lot of older adults are living with one or more chronic disease. But they don't want to be defined by that disease. They don't want their life to be defined by that disease. They, they want to acknowledge they have that disease, but they, they don't want to live in the world of the sick mm -hmm. because they're older. And I think that therefore they want to try and minimize the impact of that disease on their lives and be able to stay in their homes, be able to be active, be able to travel, be able to do those things. And so I think that's one of the reasons why people are beginning to embrace these technologies um, where they can, you know, measure their, their blood sugar, their, their blood pressure, their, you know, anything that's going on with them, communicate with their care team, make a change on the fly with their medication and then see how things go over the next 24 hours without having to wait for three weeks for the doctor's appointment. Can I travel? Should I, should I cancel my trip? All those kinds of things. And I think this is, this is really where it's going to impact people in their, in their daily lives. It sounds liberating, actually, mm -hmm. yeah. that we're no longer tied to you know, our, our physical location because our caregiver, physician, nurse, other health professional can be accessed anywhere at any time. Yeah. And healthy aging is so much more than just the physical body and the disease. 
It's about who we are in our world, our society, our connection with people, our mental health, our feeling of well-being. And so I think that's another exciting part of where healthy aging is going, is looking at people as whole people and in the, in the context of their families and communities. Let's talk a little bit more about that. How does, how does that piece of it, the more, uh, the more kind of quality of life mm -hmm. aspects of the healthcare equation factor in to how it is that uh, healthcare is adapting to not only the aging population, but, but just people in general. So when you think about health, one of the biggest predictors of living long and well is connection with others. So connection with families and friends, neighbors, people who are important to you. And in the past, we wouldn't have thought of that as being part of a prescription for health because the focus was more on medications and on treatments. But now as you think more glo globally about health being that state of well-being, technology can help in ways of connecting people. So for example, those who are very isolated in their homes can have connections through, through different types of technologies where they're in real time and we can be checking in with each other and have relationships that transcend our physical space. And that's one really important way of engaging people. It, it sounds like with all this technology and the ability for people to stay not only in their homes but in their neighborhoods and communities that it's going to transform sort of the, the physical aspect of how healthcare is delivered. Um, 20 years from now, will, will hospitals look the same, be the same as they are today with all of this deluge in technology? Well, that's a, that's a great question that we don't know yet, but we assume that there will be um, more emphasis on care outside of institutions, um, shorter lengths of stay. One thing we haven't talked about is this also, these technologies might mean that you can go home from the hospital early. We, we're, we have some programs at UC Davis where we're able to get people home and then video conference with them in their home after surgery, for instance. And, you know, hopefully that will allow people to leave the hospital earlier. And therefore, if we're shortening lengths of stay, um, we can decrease the number of beds. Um, hospitals, you know, will, you know, they'll always need to be um, ICUs and emergency rooms and they'll have to be um, operating rooms and, and people will have to stay in the hospital for some time, but we're hoping to decrease that time that people are in hospitals and, and make the, the transition of care more smooth from the care team that's in the hospital continues to see you, but they continue to see you in your home. Mm -hmm. Let's go even further out. Projecting out, you know, uh, in the next 20 years or so, how do you think that we as individuals will be affected by all this innovation? What will we be doing differently as we monitor our health and try and enjoy a higher level of wellness using this technology? Well, I think one of the things that we, we haven't talked about that, that gets to part of your, your question is how much privacy are people willing to give up? Interesting. To, to, you know, do you want your, your care team to know that you're, when you're taking your pill, what your weight is every day, what you ate, you know, when you cheated on your diet and those kinds of things. So I think it really depends a lot on how much of that people are willing to give up when they're sick. When people aren't sick, they're probably not willing to give up much privacy. When they are sick, if it means being in a nursing home, or staying at home, people are willing to give that up. And so I think it will change our relationship with our healthcare teams. And the healthcare teams need to change as well to, to be in a, you know, provide care in a model like this where that is more um, patient and person centric. And if you were to name just one technology that you think is going to be exciting and transformative? Just its name, what is it? I would say communication technology. Technology that really brings information to the, the point of, of action. 
So the ways that we can integrate information and use it in, in meaningful ways. All right. Well, thank you both. Uh, good luck and much success in your work. Thank you. And looking thank for you. all of that training for caregivers in Absolutely. the future. Absolutely. And that's our show. Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. Five Star Bank, we create thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive, from economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. This Studio Sacramento episode is supported by UC Davis Health, where doctors, nurses, researchers, and staff share a passion for advancing health. Learn more about their latest medical innovations at health.ucdavis.edu. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at KVIE.